before we dare venture into that, let's stop and invite our Father to be with us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for life, for freedom, for the ability to know you which outshines all human existence. We say welcome to this place this morning. We ask that you would be with us, that we would see something, that we would gain something, that we would take a step closer to you to be hand in hand with you, like it says in Isaiah 41. We want you to take us by the hand, Father. I desire it. We desire it. We're all your children here. We cannot live without you at all. Therefore, we ask you to be with us, and to fill us with your spirit, that we may see just how huge it is what you have done for us. We thank you for this day of rest, Father. Amen. Our uh, memory text in our uh, lesson, this verse, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation, to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. How in the world is that possible? No condemnation. You have to take it for what it says, right? I have struggled with that for a long time. Well, we're going to talk about judgment today. And that's actually the reason. Well, let me, let us back up just a sec. The only actual... See, when you're up here, you feel vulnerable. Very, very vulnerable. It takes a great deal of courage to put out what you think, and I have the highest respect for anybody who's up here. The only complaint I've ever had is that I'm too kind of sour, I'm too serious. Let's see if we can go forward one. Why are there two resurrections? Let's go back. I found this quote. This is from the United Nations, one of the directors, David Spangler. Now, his position is he's the director of the Planetary Initiative. Now, think about that, the director of the Planetary Initiative. is What he said, no one will enter the New World Order unless he or she will make a pledge to worship, worship Lucifer. No one will enter the new age unless he will take a Luciferian initiation. This involves the Queen of Heaven. I've been perusing the perimeters of what we know for about 20 years, and I can tell you that what is out there is absolutely overwhelming. It's ready to go, and the only reason why it hasn't happened yet, I believe, is because God is waiting for all of his people, and that's more than just Adventists all who love him to see something and to recognize that he has something available and he wants to give it to us. So I want to follow that this morning. We're going to get there, but we're going to go a different route. To kind of put this all in perspective, I just want to do a little bit of an overview. In the rebellion in heaven, which is what the final events are actually answering. What is Lucifer going to say to God in his presence? I mean, how did he drive out the angels? How do you how do you fill a created being's mind with doubt about God enough to get them out and to question and to say, I don't want this? And part of the answer is we still have that around with us today, and it's all about legalism, and it's about saying that God is not who you think he is. As I've read some of the different stuff that is in our denomination and elsewhere, it seems to me that Satan said, we're not arguing about his power, but he does this stuff just to make you jump through the hoops. He's arbitrary. He demands something. In Ezekiel, we read that uh, Satan said, I'm going to put my throne alongside the Most High. And God said, okay, we're going to run the two systems and see what you think. 
we're going to let them come to fruition. You get to choose. And it's always been that way. So at the cross, Christ says, it is finished. So what was finished? Peter talked about this in his letters at the end of the New Testament and said this was so startling to the angels that probably still had questions from the rebellion in heaven that they desired to look into that for eternity. This is from people who've never actually walked or from angels, beings, who've never been had to walk our walk. What it is like to live with doubt, perplexity, pain. Ask Eric Nelson how he's doing. He has felt that shot from the devil and it has almost destroyed him. It's the strength of God that pours into him. He, I have the highest respect for that man. So then it was done. God said it is finished. The father pulls back the protection. You get to see who Satan is. He would kill his own father. Besides all the other stuff that happened before them, all the misrepresentations and lies about God that Lucifer had put out there, Jesus said, this is who I am. And if you've seen me, you've seen the father. We're nice guys. We're not holding anything back from you. So everybody saw it but humanity. And that's because we're living in Satan's cloud. His, dis his deception. And I think it's still there. We have a hard time actually seeing who the Father really is and as good as he is and what the issues are. So you had 2,000 years of confusion. We call them the Dark Ages. But then notice that there's something else. The answer to that that God gives to people and you can find this in, I believe it's chapter 38 of the Great Controversy. The Holy Spirit is poured out, which isn't given for the purpose of taking the gospel to the world. The Holy Spirit is given out to connect you to your Father in a way that humanity has never, ever experienced, yet which is the reason for why we are created. And I'll show you a, a little piece on that later. God designed us to be in connection with him, with his spirit to be indwelling, and anything short of that is not his objective. Anything less than that is unacceptable, but he's been putting up with this, powering us, letting the two systems go so that you finally get to make a choice. Your choice. Not imposed by him, your choice. With the Holy Spirit poured out, people are so enamored, it's like the day of Pentecost where they get it. They have a real living connection. They're powered by God. And they can't wait to tell everybody how really cool this is. There's more to it than that. So what does Satan do? You get his day of worship imposed. And that's been that way since the very beginning, since the flood probably before. And so God says, all right, you want to be a world leader? Because Satan appears as a being, probably in today's vernacular, an alien. We're going to be invited into a stellar group. I'm going to fix everything for you. Here's the answer to your disease. Here's the answer to energy conservations. It's going to be as overpowering to people when he shows up as it was to Eve in the garden. I can guarantee you because I've seen part of it. And that's why the Bible says it will be, even the very elect are going to have a hard time. It will be really good from his point of view and for people who don't know God. So God says, all right, you want to put yourself in my place? I'm going to start pulling back. I'm going to pull back control, and I'm going to let things fall apart, and that's what the pledge really are, to challenge Satan's authority, I think. Again, this is just my opinion, but that's what it looks like to me. And Satan is powerless to do anything. In one of the plagues, a third of the world's population is destroyed. Do you think that'll make CNN? If there's anything of power left, I wonder. So then you have this interesting thing of two resurrections separated by a thousand years. One, one event, Christ coming, uh, Corinthians, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up with him together in the air and he could have the second resurrection I mean everybody could come he could do this all at one fell swoop all the things we know but he doesn't there's a reason for it 
that has to do with his character and the kind of good guy that he is. Before we go there, there's something that I have to bring up because I've been wrong partially about this and I've been up here talking about it. I didn't ever understand this. I thought that Christ, when he died for my sins, he swapped positions. That isn't entirely true. While he did pay for my sins, it dawned on me one day, and we're going to read a couple texts here. I get that I'm a sinner, and that I'm, which is separated from my father, because of Adam, and generation, and generation, and all these steps down like a ladder to me and you. It didn't occur to me till in the last couple of weeks that when Christ died for us, he actually went one step up and intercepted and cut off that line of sin. Now think about that. He just didn't mess in the system. He went above it, and then all the way down comes an inheritance, a gift. When you look in Strong's Concordance and you find all the stuff on inheritance, there is a ton. And it all seems to reflect the basic idea. I like Colossians 1.12, the Father who made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Hebrews 9.15-16, and I've kind of chopped it a little bit. They that have been, <clears throat> excuse me, they that have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must of necessity be the death of him that made it. Christ died, and now in his will is everything he has. I mean everything. So, you get this. This is uh, one of the founders of our church. She wrote it in a book called Acts of the Apostles, page 388. It's based in reference to Galatians 6.15. With un and this is Paul talking in his work with the Galatians. With unanswerable arguments, he set before them their privilege of becoming free men and women in Christ. Free. And his arguments were unanswerable. There's no room for error here at all, not even 1%. Through whose atoning grace all who make full surrender are clothed with the robe of his righteousness. He took the position that every soul who would be saved must have a genuine personal experience in the things of God. Now I can tell you that in meeting in different groups that I'm associated with, we all struggle. We don't, we're not quite clear on what, how do we take that gift. We get that it's free. We get that it's a gift, that you can't earn it. But it dawned on me when I was reading this that the real key is right there, personal. That means that Christ has to come to you because I cannot go to him. That was kind of a mind blower to me. It means my efforts aren't worth nothing. Now I can focus on him, I can pray, I can talk, I can study, I can share, but those are small compared to his presence. And it's overwhelming. Let's talk about personal. Ephesians 2. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's house, his sanctuary, his temple built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone in him the whole building is joined together. Whoop. And rises to become a holy temple in the Lord and in him, you, all of you, are being built together to become a dwelling, here it is, in which God lives by his spirit key to this entire thing is his spirit living in us. Isn't it interesting that one of the biggest issues in the Adventist church is since 1888 we have stumbled and faltered. Not sure of the outpouring of the latter rain. Here it is. His purpose is to live in you. His purpose I think is to pour out the latter rain. His purpose is to make you into what he desires which is him dwelling in you 
you have a relationship and it's living. Up till, what, up till now, a lot of what we've had, not all of it, is structure. It hasn't been a lot about relationship. We have the Gospels, we have the Sabbath, we have all this stuff. But in the middle of that, very few make it through to have that honest, open relationship with God. I have desired that most of my life. I'm not willing to wait anymore. I want that. It's what he created me and you for. So what he's desired to give us for a long time, part of the reason why I think it hasn't happened, is because we didn't understand, or at least I didn't, and I know others who haven't, understood that that is his intent. So you bring into that the process of inheritance. Now I've said before up here that I think that Christ died for all men and that your default position is that you're saved. You have to choose though. You have to make an awareness. God is not going to force it on you. You have to decide, do I want it? Yes, Satan's going to pummel you to get you not to go there because you have an inheritance. Every person in this building, every person watching, every person in the world has an inheritance and it is to live with God, period. That's it, cut and dried, that's it. I don't have to earn it. God's gonna take care of my sins. Let's just put that and leave that there for now because there's more there. You have two things here coming together. One is an inheritance and the other is Christ wants to live in you. Now your inheritance isn't about walking around on streets of gold. It starts today here. Your inheritance is the Holy Spirit coming in. Look what happened to Moses when he just met God. He glowed. Adam and Eve glowed. In Patriarchs and Prophets, Mrs. White says that the reason why they glowed is because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's God's plan for his children to be with them intimately. And part of that is no eyes anywhere else. That's one of the reasons why he's delayed, because we have gotten really involved with the world. And it's okay to be involved with the world, but you've got to bring your focus back to him and spend time with him and let him heal you. You have to understand that he wants to come in and that when he comes in, he is a big deal. There's no room for a lot of stuff. And the more he comes in, the more he pushes out everything else. Let that be a lesson that, or a note that you think about today. I'm going to say this again. Your inheritance is God's presence in you today. It starts today, not in heaven, here. A living relationship with Jesus, not based on anything you do or don't do. He wants to come in, let him fix it. Spend time with him, keep your eyes on Jesus, and let him rule the roost. I will come in and eat with you. Let it, why eat? Well, the biggest thing we have in the New Testament about eating is Christ and communion service, a Last Supper. This is my body broken for you. This is my blood spilt for you. When he eats with you, he wants to put that reality into you. He wants you to know what it exactly it is he did for you and that the only way that's going to work, it's not structure, it's relationship. You become a real partaker of what he did and what he meant at the Last Supper, I think. This is Desire of Ages 161. From eternal ages, it was God's purpose that every created being from the bright and holy Sarah to man should be a temple for the indwelling of the Creator. Because of sin, which is turning aside and making decisions other than Him, humanity ceased to be a temple. They didn't want Him. Darkened and defiled by evil, the heart of man no longer revealed the glory of the Divine One. But by the incarnation of the Son of God, the purpose of heaven is fulfilled. God dwells in humanity, and through saving grace, the heart of man becomes again his temple. What does that mean? When you get, finally, 
that God wants to live in you. That he can fix it. You become a child. Children don't worry about the finances of the home. Children don't worry about what all the responsibilities their children. Christ said, even as you if, unless you become a little child, you're probably not going to get this. Because when you get that, I'm in control and I do everything for you like a good parent. I'll take care of all the details, not you. This truly is the good news. This is about simply saying, I want you to do that, Father. That's all it is. Let him. It's a choice. And so by saying no to that, we have made a legitimate choice, but it also takes us away from our inheritance. This is one of the granddaddies of all texts in the Old Testament. The voice of those who flee and escape from the land of Babylon declares in, in Zion, this is declaring from Zion, the vengeance of the Lord our God, the vengeance of his temple. Think about that. What's the vengeance of his temple? You see that most clearly at the second resurrection. Christ is standing there. Guys, you get it all. But you said no. The judgment isn't his, it's people's. They get to choose and now... For the first time in the history of the earth, Satan is no longer free to put out his lies, his deceptions. He has to stand with all of the rest of the created beings. And God is standing back saying, there it is. If you want it, it's yours. And nobody chooses it. I get that we have become so stiffened and our thoughts on probation and all this stuff, we cannot possibly conceive of a God who would actually still let somebody into the city. It seems anti-Adventist, anti-biblical. But if he's truly love, and I think he is, I think he would if someone wanted. But he already knows that nobody wants it, so that's why he's brought them up in the second resurrection. There's your gift. People say no. The vengeance of his temple is saying, you can hurt me all you want, but I still love you. I'm not forcing you. You can have it. You always could. The only existence, and I think that all the people who are living, all created beings at that point will understand one common point, and that is, is that God is all there is. There's no alternate universes. There's nothing else. There's just him. And all of the universe is his. And he exists both inside and outside. And there's no other choice. If you want to exist, you have to do it with me. And I'm going to power you freely. And I'm going to love you to death. People don't want it. That is just absolutely amazing. And you get to see that too, and we're coming to why that is. But in the process, how this all works, this is one of the ways that you take up your cross. Jesus gave up his right to be right. Ultimate power on the cross. With a word, he could have come down. With a thought, he could have come off the cross. And he chose not to do that because if he would have, he would have violated the process as if we don't have divine power in us to get us out of trouble. Christ could not use it and still save humanity. So he died. He could have, very easily. And that was the temptation. That was the overwhelming dark power that pressed in on him. I think that probably is why one of the forefathers of our church said, it was so intense that he barely felt the cross. He could not even entertain a drop of thinking that he was going to leave the cross because if he would have, man would have been lost. Satan would have then been able to say, you are unfair. You are unfair. You can't have it both ways. So 
So when you go back to Genesis, I finally get now why Jesus knelt in the dust and made Adam out of dust and breathed into him life. He wanted to make sure that we knew that Adam, that he was Adam's father. He just could have created it, created him, spoke him into existence. But he took time. He wanted to make that point. So that when he died, now you'll understand that you have an inheritance. And you can't do anything about that inheritance, by the way. It's there whether you want it or not. I've talked about that blue presence. We've done that again today. We get that from, in case you haven't seen any of this before, burning sulfur is pure blue like sapphire, like the color of that screen. It's glowing, almost neon. And I think when I've wondered if John the Revelator, when he's seen, he uses a description of something he can't possibly describe, this blue glow over the entire surface of the earth. I think it's Jesus' presence there. He doesn't, he doesn't want that mistaken or changed. And so he uses something that you just can't mix up. You either have to cut it out. If you want to change the meaning, you have to leave it out of the scriptures entirely. So here's the deal. Two resurrections. Let's say that you have a really good friend or your mother who you are close to, or your father or a brother, and in the thousand years that separate the two resurrections, you're like, Father, why aren't you here? And Jesus can take, the angels can take out their records, the transcript of your life, seeing into your heart why you made those decisions. And you can read it, and it's not, it still leaves that little bit of, Doubt. Are you sure? So Christ resurrects those people later. And you're going to see that person that you care about. I'm just using this for an illustration. You'll get to see them choose no. And you'll understand that Christ has not forced them in any way, shape, or form. This is for all of the redeemed to see that Christ actually meant what he said. I don't come here to push life on you. I'm not arbitrary. Everything I've got, I give you. You get to go to the throne. And that's when the reality sets in. That People do get to make a choice. Judgment isn't about God forcing or punishing you because you won't love him. That's sick even by today's standards. It's not our problem. If a man is abusing his wife and says, you love me or I'm going to beat you, that's really what this is if you have punishment at the end of time. Most of the time when I grew up in we understood there was a hellfire. There was punishment at the end of time. So I'm going to suggest something else to you. The judgment. If you go back and read two sources. One is Mrs. White. Go back and read where fire consumes the wicked. It's actually split into two parts. She says that fire comes out of the ground and it comes out of the sky. It's not coming from God. It doesn't say that. If you go back to Genesis, what did the Holy Spirit do when it started these sequential steps of creation? Created. Saw that it was done. Built another layer on it. Created. Another layer of firmament, animals, plants. God supplies the order and the light. And I think what he's doing is what he did to Jesus on the cross. When the Father stepped away, Jesus' life sputtered and went out. And it was so horrible, he cries out in anguish, My God, my God, why are you forsaking me? Why are you leaving me? It's a living death when God pulls away. If you want a punishment, there it is. This is God pulling away, and everything that we know is based firmly on him and everything he's done for us. All the rules of life, of structure, of matter, of the universe, of time, of relationship, everything comes from him, and when he pulls away, that falls apart. 
And there you have the wicked who say, I don't want that, and they are going through what Christ did. And we know how bad it was for Christ. It was so bad that he called out, Father, forgive them. I don't want them to go through this. This is that bad. In anguish. But they all go through it, and it's even worse for them. And the reason is, is because here's Jesus. I could have had that the whole time. I am still saying no, and it's right there. I could grasp that hand. I have said no. Not Christ. I have said no. Think about that. And then go look at the Greek meaning of the words of fire. Go look it up. It's similar. This model fits much better with God is love. I'm proposing it. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not coming to you from an Adventist or religious or denominational point of view. I just think that there's something here. I think it's different and better than we've ever thought. You can take me aside after Pastor Eric Franklin. I'm more than eager to hear what you have to say. So now, if, you, if we understand that, I think that's why sin won't rise up a second time. Because we won't want it to. We won't ever want to deviate from our Father. We will want to be with Him. That's why the redeemed, the 144,000, which is the generation of those resurrected at the end of time, follow Him wherever He goes. They're so enamored with Him that they don't ever want to let Him out of their sight again. And that's been His purpose all along. There's going to be no more doubt. That's how you do that. And He gave you the choice. And after that, you get to experience what infinity can think of and dream up for you. And in that process, you get to know him. So here's what I run into. We're going to close with this. Two things. I run into the most opposition of this from Adonis. I run into very little from Baptists, even Jehovah's Witnesses. I talk a lot about this kind of stuff. And I'm just proposing it. I'm not preaching it that you have to believe this to be saved. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying, what if this is true? Wouldn't that be good news? That I get Christ today, that I have an inheritance, that he will come to me, that I can go wait upon the Lord? Patient, kneeling, waiting for him to come. Not wanting to do anything other than what he wants me to do. I get that I'm not there yet. That's where I'd like to be. So I chose this picture because we attempt to put limits on God in our thinking. I'm going to remind you how small you are. This is Saturn. That blue dot right there is Earth. All of humanity, everything we've ever known, has risen and died on that planet. It's just a dot. We're pretty insignificant in the universe. The God who made that, way bigger. This is just one little solar system. We're part of one galaxy, and there are a trillion plus galaxies. I think he's bigger. I think his will can impose on us if he wants. So here's another one. This photo was taken on February 14th, 1990. You may not be able to see it on that. There's a little tiny dot in here. That's the Earth. Taken by Voyager 1. And it's way out past Pluto. It was just near the edge of the Oort cloud. Level. Since then, Voyager 1, they actually fired it up this week. They sent a message to it and it responded. It did a course correction. It's way out past, it's out into interstellar space now. And the image they said that if they, they did the calculations based on the camera stuff, this little Earth, that little tiny dot right there, would be 10 times fainter. We are nothing but a speck in God's universe. Nothing. And he wants us to go to the throne and be there with him and just live. To exist with him. 
I may have said some things that make you uncomfortable. It's not my intent, but I do want us to think. And one of the reasons for that is this denomination was started by people who stepped outside of the box from at least five different faiths. I'm thinking God is better than you think he is. I just wanted to give you something to think about. Let's bow our heads for a prayer. Father, I think you're that good. I think you're that big. I think that you really are love. I think that Satan has been lying. I think that we have an inheritance. I think that you want to put your spirit in us and reform that relationship that was lost in Eden. I just want to say thank you. And I say you are welcome to come in. There's so many flaws you're going to have to fix. You're going to have to straighten up my living room, Father. But I'm going to put that burden on you, and I'm going to try and stay connected. Over this. And if you'll enable me, and I say this for all of us, if you will enable us, we will follow you and follow your path. We ask for your blessing today, of your presence of clarity, of strength. There's so much going on. So many of us have been just beaten almost to death at times. You can fix it. I know you can. And it's simply by your presence. Help us not to doubt you, Father. The only way that's going to happen is if your presence is in what we need know who you are. I thank you so much. You are holy 